Hello, Jeff here with Accurate Rifles and Restorations. Today we got kind of a unique job in the shop and I thought I'd go ahead and video record it. Might be interesting. Um, we've got a Weatherby Mark V that's obviously been custom Cerakoted at one point. Uh, this is from my guy Alex up in Cody. We've been working together for several years. I've been putting together a lot of rifles for him. And <clears throat> actually, I've actually rebarreled this one, I know, at least one time before. Uh, but he wants a new one. He wants a new barrel on this in 338 Norma. So that's what we're going to be doing. Now, the Weatherby. Weatherby is an interesting company. They've gone through a lot of changes over the years since their inception. Um, I'm not going to go into the history of the company or anything like that. I don't, I have no real, I mean, I, I don't really even know the extent of it. <clears throat> um, they are what they are. They've got the Vanguards and the Mark Fives. And uh, oh, there's probably something else I'm not thinking of right now, but. Not really based off the Remington 700. Uh, so as you can see, it's got uh, integral recoil lug, which is pretty nice. And a nice big beefy thick recoil lug there. It's machined out of this one piece of steel. And this particular action is actually made, so this was after they moved to Sheridan, and this is actually made in Sheridan, so that's nice to see. Because for at some point in their timeline, they had all their uh, actions and barrels manufactured in Japan by Hala, which was kind of a turnoff for a lot of guys. Um, American company, but outsourced it to Japan. So you don't really like to see that too often. But, you know, there's fans out there for Weatherby's. They, there's, there's guys that like them a lot. I'm impartial. I don't, I don't care too much. And they, they are what they are. The other thing about this is it's kind of not conducive for blueprinting. So the bolt in particular is enormous. The bolt body is giant. It's 840 thousandths. Way, way bigger than a Remington would be. And that's not the big issue. The issue here is, especially in the front, there's nothing... Like on a Remington, you've got a bearing surface for the bolt in the front, and this, all this is, is it just front of that lug or front of that bolt just goes in here, stops here, and then the lugs, the nine lugs here, lock into, lock in. So there's nothing to sleeve really, right? You can't put a sleeve on the outside of these lugs, and if you put one here, I mean, it does nothing. It's not, it's not bearing on anything there, right there at all. And then the rear, it could probably be done. The problem again here is they put a cutout <clears throat> for their, oh, I guess it's a bolt stop, but uh, you gotta, some of them you got to pull the trigger as you pull the bolt back you got to pull the trigger and that releases a little catch from this track and then you can get the bolt out of the action um same thing there's i mean obviously it's fluted so there's just not a lot of surface area it's just going to be i've never tried it it could probably be done but i don't i already got gray hair and i don't have much to rip out so i really don't want to do that to myself so that being said that kind of is what it is so we're not blueprinting this there's not much way to do it and then the face of the receiver looks pretty decent um dial test indicator on that shows very very little run out so we're not going to really worry about any of that for this job uh the receiver itself is a little unique in that it has an kind of like a mauser it has an inner ring in there so the barrel essentially is going to torque mainly on here on the torque shoulder but it also needs to be very close if not touching that inner ring inside there 
Hopefully you can see that. There we go. That. So that's a little bit different there. So it's a little bit more challenging. You have to get that length right on the money. And then it is what's called a recessed breech. So the bolt nose kind of comes up and protrudes in there. So it is very similar to a Remington 700 in the three rings of steel with a recessed breech like that. It's not nearly as deep, but it's a lot wider. Uh, so a little bit different there. The threads are exactly the same as Remington. It's a, it's a one in 16 by 16 inch thread. And the length of it's calculated by the length from the bolt face to the inner ring there. This particular action is 699. Well, it's 702, but uh, we have to leave a little for clearance. And as that torques into place and compresses, it will essentially torque on both surfaces. Right, so action's ready to go. Here's a brand new proof research barrel, uh, 338 caliber, uh, one in 9.4 twist at 20, oh boy, how long was this thing? 24, at 24 inches. And uh, just a typical Sendero carbon fiber proof research. So the other piece of this video that may be slightly interesting is we're going to chamber this up in a different, kind of a different method. So this time around, we're going to be using my blueprint jig as kind of like a mini double four jaw chuck. So we'll be holding this up in the four jaw chuck. And that will allow us to indicate this barrel in off the natural curvature of the bore. Rather than, as you've seen me do a lot in the past, centering off of either end, this one's going to be a little bit different because we're going to be centering that barrel essentially from the very beginning of the breech to essentially where the throat's going to be in there. So, you know, three inches or so in there for a Norma. And it's a little bit longer case. So our chambering services offer two different methods, one uh, costing a little bit more than the other. So you have your choice of chambering between centers or uh, centering the barrel between centers and then chambering it like that, which means each end of the barrel is running true and concentric, but the middle may have, so every barrel has a little bit of a, just a little bit of a curvature. So that curvature is gonna be going in and you can kind of see it if you look down the barrel, if you center both ends. Uh, I've seen a few that are so straight, it's in, imperceivable, uh, but most barrels, even the high-end precision ones, they're gonna have a little wobble in there, in the middle somewhere. So you'll look at the, you'll look here, it's spinning true and, and nice and round, and true and nice and round here, but somewhere in the middle of the barrel, it's going rrr, 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 rrr. <clears throat> So, Really, uh, we're splitting hairs at this point. That's not a huge deal. I mean, we're talking incremental steps and in accuracy here. So, but Alex, he wants the absolute best here. So we're going to do it that way. <clears throat> so you'll see that in the lathe, how we're going to center this. And we're going to go back and forth. So we'll, we'll center it. So it'll be in the jig. Let's see, we we'll need place them this way. Right, so the barrel will be installed inside this jig, and these two set screws on the fore and aft will be able to uh, will allow us to center that barrel within this area. So we'll go in with a dial test indicator with a long reach probe and reach on in there. So that will the front screws will control the roundness centering, and then the aft set screws here actually control the axial alignment. So we're just gonna go back and forth with the indicator and adjusting 
until both sections of this barrel are running perfectly true. Uh, this is, I believe Gordy Gritters developed this whole method. Uh, he, he teaches this. Uh, I learned it from his kind of teachings. And then we hired him to come out and he showed, he, we actually, we did it together and he showed me personally how, how he does that and some, some things to watch for and all that stuff. So, so you'll see that. Uh, so once that barrel's centered up, indicated in, it's the same process. We're going to be turning down the tenon to the length. We're going to be uh, threading it to one and one sixteenth by 16 threads per inch. We're going to cut the recess in the breech for the bolt nose. Pre-drill, come in with a boring bar and bore that out true, and then come in with a reamer and uh, do the chambering. So the big difference here is how we're holding the barrel. So you'll get to see some of that stuff, uh, portions of that in this video. And we'll be using a, who makes this one? PTG 338 Norma Sammy Spec Reamer for this job, as well as a set of go and no go gauges, also made by PTG. Okay. And then uh, also kind of a neat one for this video series is going to be the muzzle device. So my customer has drawn up this quick little CAD drawing. This is the muzzle device he wants on the muzzle end. So we're going to actually be fabricating that in-house uh, custom to his specifications here. So we'll show a little bit of that manufacturing process of that part. So that'll be installed on the, obviously the muzzle end. And he wants three quarter, 24 threads on the, on the muzzle for that, for that device. So yeah, this ought to be a fairly interesting video. Uh, so stay tuned for the progress here and uh, enjoy the ride. All right, what you're seeing here is uh, the blueprinting jig. I am backing out the screws there to kind of get it ready for the barrel. Uh, must be the other side there. So just making them wide enough to get the barrel in there. And uh, looks like now I'm getting some tape. Kind of pre-positioning it, seeing where I need to put some of that tape. That's just some good old duck brand masking tape. Looks like about one inch variety. Beige. Yep, sticking that tape on there, protecting that. Now those set screws uh, have aluminum tips, so they don't typically mar anything but the aluminum tends to leave leave a mark sometimes like just rubs off and you can rub it off but i'm just trying to save myself in trouble down the road just kind of holding it center there and getting those screws down starting to touch and i guess uh i guess we skipped that so <laughs> Here it is in the four jaw chuck in the lathe. Now I've got my, looks like the half thousandths indicator with a long probe. So we're, uh, we're just touching off in the very mouth of the, the beginning of the breech section. And I'm using those rear screws to do the axial alignment as I was kind of describing. <clears throat> so yeah, there's uh working those those rearward screws. Now I'm coming in as far as I can. And we're gonna use the forward screws to control the roundness. 
centering and round here. So it's just a matter of going back and forth until you get that needle the least amount of run out possible. Nope, switched over to a wrench, so we're getting we're getting close now. So I start with the finger snug, and then once we get real close, I start snugging it down with a wrench. And I don't know, I don't. I used to use a, an inch pound torque wrench for this, but it it drives you nuts because it just doesn't. It's all about feel. So now we're going to the rearward again, doing the axial. Axial alignment here. And again with the wrench, so obviously we're getting pretty close. I know you can't see the indicator at this point. I mean, you can see it, but not very close, so don't worry. Don't worry, we'll be zooming you in here soon. All right, see? Told you. There we go. Now you can see that thing. So we're running as true as could be right there in the throat area. And we're moving back to the mouth of the breech area. Yeah, so there you go. Now I'm marking the top. So the this would be the high side of the barrel. And bottom. Actually, this would be where I want the receiver to index. So I want the top of the receiver at the T. Or top. Now we're putting on some die cam. Some blue die cam. Getting the cutter position. Looks like I'm doing some facing here. Facing off the face of the breech. Final finishing pass, I would reckon. Shallow depth of cut, high rip'ems, and a slow feed rate to ensure maximum surface finish quality. Okay, that's been faced. Going in here, marking off the length. Set of dial calipers. Touch off. Dial in a little depth and take my first pass so I can set a stopping point. A little bit short of that line. Yep, there's the end. Set a zero, back off. Take a bit more depth of cut. Rinse and repeat. Now this barrel is being held in a blueprinting jig, as you saw. So I'm not going to be hogging off material here. We're taking some, probably 20, 20 thousandths, maybe 25 thousandths per pass. I do not want to knock this out of alignment. We're going to be checking throughout the process, but uh, that's why I'm not uh, taking a bunch off at once, as you're, you're seeing there. So it's not me being timid, it's me being careful not to knock it out of the line. This is precision work here. Not, uh, I'm not turning axles here, I'm turning the barrel. bump the camera and looks like I'm using my Mitutoyo one to two inch micrometer outside micrometer 
to check the diameter. Okay, looks like that's done. Diameter's been turned. Now we're doing a small relief cut behind the threads, right in front of the shoulder of the barrel. Now the weather bee is threaded all the way all the way to the front, so we need that little relief groove in order to get a proper shoulder torque because the threads I'm about to cut cannot go all the way to the shoulder due to the limitations of the tool and just physical limitations of an outside thread. So that just relieves material so that there's no uh, interference. And we're just checking. So minor diameter um, of this particular thread. Coming in with the threading tool now. I'm gonna chamfer the very edge of that just to give it a little bit of a lead. Touch off and engage the half nut and take a test pass. So this is just gonna make sure we're at 16 threads per inch and the machine is behaving nicely and all that good stuff, so. Shut down, get in there with the thread pitch gauge and check. And yes, indeed, we are at 16 threads per inch. Okay, so we can go ahead and proceed to depth. Threading pass by pass until we achieve the proper double depth. Oh, you like how I just nicked that shoulder? <laughs> oh, yeah, that happened. Don't worry, we'll, we'll clean that up at the end. I got a little ambitious on my half nut lever there. Oh, on the first pass, dude, that's hilarious. So this is not sped up, this is how I thread. Nice and fast. Well, maybe not fast, but uh, not slow either, you know. Medium. <laughs> So, typical threading for a 60 degree thread, feeding in with the compound rest and using the cross slide as a zero return. That's so how you're gonna get that nice chip load on the left side of the tool, progressively cutting deeper and deeper and deeper until we get to that proper depth that we all love. I think it's something like 45 thousandths, something like that for a one and one sixteenth inch, 16 thread per inch thread. Probably the last pass here before I start checking. Blowing off the schmutz. Yep, and here we come in and do a test fit. See if we got enough or still got a little to go. And judging by the looks of this, that's getting tight. So yep, we're gonna take another pass. A little cutting oil. That's starting to look like a thread, huh? a nice fit look at that all the way to the shoulder hey yeah 
making sure we're bumping up against that shoulder like we should. So looks like that threading operation is done. Onward to the next thing. Okay, now we're going to be squaring that shoulder up. Very sharp. Greater than 90 degree single point cutting tool there. Very sharp. Just to skim that shoulder, get it uh, squared up perfectly. Get our length. So here I'm checking the length of uh, whatever we calculated for that particular action. I think I mentioned it earlier. I can't remember what it was, but there's the uh, top. Oh yeah, that's the other thing we're trying to get <laughs> is length and get it to index properly here at the very top. Well, where the high side of the barrel would be at the end of the uh, muzzle. And looks like we're there with a little for the crush, for the torquing. Now I'm just checking with the light, make sure there's no light gap, light tight all the way around. It's very rare that this does not work or happen, but this one has that internal ring, so it's best to make sure we're not torquing on only that ring, but we're torquing on the outside shoulder. Now I'm using my bolt as just a little more leverage to get that on there, just a little more. Because <clears throat> I may have just seen a little bit of, I think I probably did see a little light gap, so I just, yeah, there we go, thumbs up. Okay, that's done. And I didn't film it, but there is the recess. Recess for the bolt nose. That's done with a single point cutter as well, just a slightly different shape. Sorry, I didn't get any footage of that. I must have forgot. But there it is, torqued on again. And now the bolt closes with a little bit of wiggle, like we like to see. A little clearance for clearance. Okay, that has been confirmed good. So we're going to unscrew this again for the very next operation. Which is oiling. Drilling. Coming in with a drill. 40 thousandths or so smaller than the finishing reamer to cut out, clear out a bunch of that material. Less punishment on the reamer. Drills are much cheaper than reamers. This is one of those fancy ticken coated twist drills. Can't tell you the size offhand. I have to check out, measure the reamer and all that. This was back in April, so I don't remember. 338 Norma. But uh, yeah, just uh, drilling deep enough. And then obviously here's a precision boring bar, carbide. Shallow depth of cut, high RPMs, slow feed rate to achieve a nice, true surface finish to give that reamer a nice start to its life. So yep, just uh, again I'd go deep enough, not so deep, that we lose any contact with the bore with the pilot. So we want to always make sure that pilot has engagement. So we're going in, usually it's about an inch to an uh, inch and a quarter depth. But uh, doing one final finishing pass here, looks like. Very fine. Just cutting out the drill chatter and the, the roughness from the drill. And uh, chewing it up there with the boring bar. And look, my machine has a reverse, a feed reverse, so I just engage that so I'm coming out, doing a ghost pass or a cleanup pass on the way out. Okay, there we go. Looks like we are properly trued up there, ready for the finishing reamer, I reckon. We'll see here in a second. 
Yeah, there it is. Good old finishing reamer aligned with the bore, held by the Gratan rifles reamer holder. Probably about 140 RPMs. Feeding in until we see some chip load uh, puking out there. And we'll pull out and clean off. Not a very exciting footage here, so we'll probably just show this one pass and then skip on to the end of the chambering operation. But there, we've got a very decent chip load going on, so it's time to pull out any time now. Come on. That's enough. There we go. <laughs> yeah. So as I get deeper and deeper, I don't let it load up that much. Don't worry. Don't you worry. When we get to the end of that chamber, I'm pulling out and cleaning off much quick, much more frequently. Now here we are with a go gauge. A CIP minimum with the green stripes. That means go. Prior to this, the chamber was thoroughly cleaned out. Make sure not to get any false readings, and looks like that bolt closes. Hooray. Okay, that's good. Now, red band. No go gauge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maximum. Okay, hopefully that does not close. Okay, good. Phew. Always hate it when that happens, huh? So there we go. The bolt hold band hold the bolt, but the bolt handle is not closing, as I'm just repeatedly pointing out here. So this chamber is now head spaced. Okay, we skipped all that. Now we are fabric cobbling the muzzle brake, custom muzzle brake. This is probably made out of a section of barrel I had laying around, or maybe just some. Bar stock? I don't know. I don't remember. But uh, turning down for the requested outside diameter. Turning it long. And it looks like a finishing pass here. Finishing pass. Okay, not real sure why I included this entire thing here in the video, but uh, I guess you're going to get to watch it. This is what a this is what a final finishing pass looks like, kids. This is exciting. Are you excited? So you can see a little bit more is being taken there closer to the chuck. That's uh, it's called flex there, so less flex towards the where it's getting clamped. <clears throat> this is not a precision part, so I don't care. Now we're drilling out the bore. This here's a 338 caliber caliber cartridge, so we're going probably 348 to 350 something. I'm not sure what the nominal fractional drill size would be there. Kind of drawing a blank. I usually use a cheat sheet for that stuff. Got my chart. But I am not in the shop shooting the, or recording this. I am in my studio. So I'm sorry, I can't tell you the exact size of that drill, but I assure you it is bigger than the bore. Now a champering tool. I like to give it a little chamfer there for appearances. Which makes it look a little nicer. Apparently I didn't like that, so I'm going in for a little more chamfer. There we go. This is a big break, so give it a big chamfer. Now I'm cutting it, parting it, 
excuse me, I'm parting it. I reckon a little bit long. In order to finish it off to proper length. <clears throat> These parting tools require a lot of oil and a slow feed rate. Because as you can see, it's a pretty brutal operation. I am not using power feed. There it goes. And now I'm coming in with a boring bar. I must have skipped the facing off footage. I assure you, I, sh I faced that off clean square. Coming in with a boring bar because this, I believe, was a three quarter 24. And, um, yeah, like, I'm going to be single point cutting those threads rather than tapping them. Because we do not want any misalignment. <clears throat> Definitely don't want a baffle strike. We're in trouble there. So we are doing this properly by single point internal threading. So yeah, you probably haven't seen this very much on the channel, if, if at all. But uh, yeah, we're single point threading this with a internal threading tool there. It's like the same one I use for blueprinting. <clears throat> so that's an internal thread for you. No, another pass. Okay, guess I didn't show much of that, but there you go. Now this is uh, looks like we're in my Precision Matthews milling machine, and we are drilling the upper and lower ports. Or this, I'm sorry, the side to side ports. But <laughs> Looks like it's upper and lower, but that's the only way I can do this in a milling machine. I believe these holes were quarter inch. Probably quarter inch. So, yeah, just uh, setting them up. Looks like I center drilled all four of them. I do have a DRO on this machine, so I probably have all those locations stored in the DRO. I probably did that to make sure it looked proper, looked correct. I don't know. I'm crazy like that, I guess. And uh, to less, uh, to eliminate the need to switch out tooling for every single hole, which uh, tends to get a little annoying <clears throat> on a manual machine. So yep, here comes that hole's done, next hole. doing four holes. I appear to be holding this in some sort of a stub that I've probably fabric cobbled up to hold this with in the milling machine without holding it by the part itself. Can't remember. I love how my camera just focuses on everything but what I'm trying to actually film. So, sorry about that. Out of focus. It's an Android. Doing what Androids do. Not focusing. This may have been before I discovered the focus lock feature. Probably was. And obviously it's not in the center of the frame, so rookie mistake there. Oh well. Apologize for my my crappy videography skills here. Am I gonna for show all four holes here? Probably am. I don't know why I'm showing all four holes. I'll probably kind of see. Oh nope. <laughs> Chamfering. So now I am chamfering the holes for appearances. Makes it look real nice and professional. Setting a depth probably there on the first one. 
Hopefully. Hey, there it's focused. Nice. Oh, now. <laughs> now I moved out of focus. Well, clearly I did not know the focus lock feature. Apologies on that. Chamfering. Once you get the depth set, it's pretty quick. It's pretty quick. And hole number four. Okay. Looks like that's completed. Yep. All right. We can move on now. Right here. Focus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was cursing this phone the entire time. Like, focus. Look at that. I kind of know what I'm doing. Okay, now we're going in and doing the side flats. No, the top and bottom flats, sorry. Just speaking. So, yeah, don't, uh, don't cringe. I'm sure a lot of you are cringing right now because I do not have a center for my milling machine table. So I'm just winging it here. That's why it's chattering like nobody's business there because it has no support. So you don't have to scold me in the comments. I know, I know. I'm a poor gunsmith. I can't afford these fancy tools, okay? I had to buy these machines. So anyway, I've sped this up. This is not real time. This is much faster because it's boring, but I did want to get it in there. But uh, it's a carbide... That's a that's a beat up carbide, high, uh, half inch cutter too. Like I've used that for bolt knob work and it's chipped all to heck. And the fact that it's not supported there at the end is just yeah. If you heard that tool, it's howling. It's it's not happy. It's not a happy tool whatsoever. <laughs> this brake is based off of a I think it's a Finnish design. I'll put that there up in the screen if I can remember. But there's the finished product. Kind of an interesting looking animal. Looks like I put some proper chamfers on the flats there. And I'm just showing off my proud work there. So there it is. All right, well, that's uh, that's pretty much it. Let's see here. I think I got some pictures I could probably put in the screen here while I'm blabbing. Yeah, I'll put some pictures in there to kind of fill in the blackness so it's not so black. But uh, some pictures of the finished product, that, uh, that muzzle brake. can kind of see it was ended up looking pretty nice uh it was probably about six hours of polishing all that chatter out <laughs> but uh, let's go through the pictures here so there's the finished breech all polished up customers usually never see this stuff but i polish everything just to make sure it looks real nice sometimes you can see the breech through when you pull the bolt out <clears throat> Just a nice presentation. Makes it look nice. Oh, uh, there's the finished stuff. So anyway, as always, thank you very much for watching the video. If you feel we've earned it, please give me a thumbs up. Hit that like button if you could. Appreciate that. To those of you that have subscribed and have stuck with us and joined us on this journey, thank you very much. For those of you on the fence, uh, if I could just persuade you to become a subscriber, we try to put out some unique and interesting videos, kind of like this. I don't know. Some people may find these interesting, maybe not, but uh, that's 
a thousand of you have shown that you have. So thank you very much for all that. Um, we're gaining some traction here on the old social medias. So thank you, Vut. Thank you very much for all that. Um, if you are looking for a rifle smith, I'm your guy. You can find of all of our contact information in the description. At least the links to get to the contact information, you'll find our website, social media, Facebook. Links there, so go ahead and click on those and peruse around. You will see hundreds of uh, examples of my work. Accurate Rifles and Restorations is a new company, relatively new company. We're coming up on one year here, but I am not a new gunsmith. I've been doing this for nearly 10 years now, so don't be afraid. I am not a newbie to this. Hopefully that's reflected and shown in the quality of work that you see in the videos there. So, again, yes, uh, I am for hire, so please uh, don't hesitate to get in touch. You can find my personal phone number in the links on the contact section of the website. You can try to send an email. Best way is just, just flat out use the phone and give me a call. So... Yeah, I think that's about all I can say here. Thank you very much for watching. Jeff Montgomery with Accurate Rifles and Restorations, signing out. Take care. Bye-bye.